I would advise Bible-believing Christians to read a lot of war stories and uh, look at a lot of cases and illustrations what soldiers went through so your eyes can kind of get out of the layout to say in comfort and see the seriousness of the battles that we go through in life. Uh, Dr. Upman recommended quite often All Quiet on the Western Front. That was a classic book, and he, uh, it was life-changing to him, and it was helpful. I would recommend that for other people. Some people like Pastor Jews preaching, and the reason why he preaches the way he is is, one, obviously, because he has a good pastor, and a lot of the way he preaches and his style is actually from my father. It's just in an uh, English format. But the second thing is because I remember when I was in his house, he has that book, and that book I could see that uh, it was bent and worn out. Now, whether he read it so often or maybe he doesn't take good care of his items either or, but the point is, is that he read that book, which kind of explains his in-your-face format on preaching. Uh, military. That's what we desperately need in Christianity. We lack a militant Christianity. We lack that so much. You notice it's more of inspirational type of Christianity, motivational, loving type of Christianity. Now, don't get me wrong, those things have their places, and we ought to act like that. But when you come to this church, don't expect, listen, don't expect love. Don't expect something comforting, something to lift you up through the day. When you come in with these false expectations, you might be let down when the devil starts attacking you, giving you a flat tire, bad things go on in your home, and you find problems going on in this church where you expect a positive environment when it's not. See, we have that. We lost our militant outlook. Okay, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The Bible says Satan is a lion who can strike you any moment. Any moment. We don't think about that. As soon as you walk out of that door, get back home, he might send an attack immediately. And don't expect that after church is over, that you got some things right in the Lord and you can rest for the rest of the day. Don't think that way. You know why people get angry easily? People get emotional easily. People get fearful easily, run away easily. They can't uh, control themselves easily. They don't mentally prepare the devil could strike at that moment. They think everything is in a normal plane. And if something disrupts their normal plane, then they freak out. Now, I'm preaching here, and the reason why I preach that is because I go through that myself. In the ministry, any unexpected thing happens, and I'm a very scheduled, disciplined person. So if something goes out of schedule for me, you can, I can understand that, see? So you have to understand that just because something disrupts your normal routine or your comfortable day doesn't mean you should freak out about it. It's expected something disrupts your expectations. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 through 9, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Notice verse 8, be sober. That means be serious. We lost our seriousness of Christian warfare. I repeat that again. So two things to notice here. One, I mentioned be sober. That means not only to be serious, but to be on guard. Be on guard. As a matter of fact, if you're always on guard, I keep getting sidetracked here, but I think this will be helpful to you. If you have an on guard mentality or you expect uh, worse things that can happen, believe it or not, your mood can become more positive, actually. I know that's hard to believe, so I'm not saying having a pessimist attitude, depressed attitude, oh, life is so bad. If you keep having that attitude, then you'll always be negative, right? But a negative mindset and the power of negative thinking, as Dr. Uckman mentioned, that, hey, something bad could happen, so when that happens, I should still be happy in the Lord because of these blessings in my life. Because Jesus died for me. I have to be mentally prepared not to complain or get depressed. See that? That's an on-guard mentality for negative expectations. And usually when you have a very low expectation 
Anything that can happen in your life it tends to be a higher, ex, higher result, a more positive outlook. But see, when you have such a high positive outlook, everything that happens in your life doesn't seem to please you. Did that make any sense or was that too deep? So usually, see, what I'm trying to say is when you have a negative outlook, a low outlook in life, any small thing that happens in life is a positive, more blessed outlook to you and you get more happy. Did that make any sense? If not, then you just go home and pray about it, okay? But I'm telling you, it makes you more thankful. It makes you more positive in life. When bad things happen in life because of my negative outlook, I tend to... I tend to see positive things that happen, even though the bad thing happened. So if my car has a, a problem in the engine and then I can't come to church, because I had a negative outlook about things can happen to me on my way to church, when I have a flat tire, I have a more positive outlook by thinking, oh, thank you, Lord, that I didn't die in a car wreck or I get hospitalized. See that? Because of that low outlook, negative mindset. It makes you rejoice more. It makes you think more positively. All right, well, anyway, I got sidetracked right there. And maybe it meant nothing to you, but that will help you, okay? I mean that. It helped me a lot. The second thing to notice is to be vigilant. That's what the verse says, be vigilant, which means to be awake and watchful. Don't be asleep to the matrix of this world with job, tiredness, how your flesh feels, finding things, vain things in life to please the flesh, worldly things to please yourself. Get out of that. Be awake on spiritual warfare. Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and then we'll look at verse 27. Now the devil, he can reside in your place anytime. So you can't give any place to him. A lot of people try to run away from their problems or their issues. You've got to work that out, that issue, whether it be fear, whether it be some issue that you don't want to face and confront and accept. You got to work on that. You got to confront that now because if you don't, the devil will use that. He knows the places in your heart where he can reside and work on. See? So you have to work on that. In my own life, and when I'm uh, with my wife, and as I pastor this church, I always have to deal with issues in those heart, and I can't let those things go. If I let those things slide and go, then what happens is I know the devil uses that later to destroy me. So what I do is I don't resume my work or anything, and I just sit still, confront that issue, pray to the Lord, read the word, go through my blessings, all the sermons and the Bible studies that I know about until I get victory over that because I know the devil will use that again. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, the Bible says, neither give place to the devil. Now, here are a list of demonic attacks that can happen and every Christian should be wary and be ready. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Here are the list of a demonic attacks that you Christians want to prepare and be ready and don't let the devil get you on, okay? The first one is error. The first one is error. All right, let me get this thing worked up now. Okay. Notice that there is a spirit of error. So Christians must test out the spirit. If you don't test out the spirit, then you won't know if what you're doing is right or wrong. Now, how many of you have made stupid, dumb decisions in your life? That's called an error. Now, what spirit led you to do that? Do you know how many Christians think that the decisions they make or the things that they do is for the Lord? But you still made a mistake, haven't you? Even though you had good intentions to do that for the Lord, but then the Lord showed you later on, no, that wasn't a good idea. So then what spirit led you to do that? Now, do you see spiritual warfare is more serious than you think? That's more serious than World War I and World War II combined. Do you understand this? We're talking about your life here. 
not just the freedom of your physical body when it comes to war or the freedom of your nation. This, this has to do personally to your life, with your life. I'll tell you how you can fix that one. You test it. Usually when you test out things, that, uh, decisions that you do, when you test them out, you're less prone to error. And the Bible already told you to test out the spirits. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. What did it say? It said to try the spirits, did it not? So try and see if that's the Holy Ghost there, if that's what the Lord's leading you to do. A lot of people, they just jump the gun. They don't test the spirits. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Look at verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. So notice there's a demonic spirit that leads you to error. If you look at verse 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and what? Spirit of error. See, so there is a demonic spirit that leads you to error. Do you know that? Are you wary of that? Or is this your first time realizing that some demonic spirit led you to error? Didn't you know even pastors are prone to that? Pastors are prone to that. M nearly every pastor will admit to you they made a wrong decision or judgment call before in their life. Probably most pastors will admit that they've done something wrong where they hurt a member unintentionally and that member doesn't come back. This is serious stuff here. So you have to understand that you can't just go by fleshly instinct, fleshly wisdom. You have to test the spirit and see, is some demonic spirit leading me to error? You have to test it. This is serious stuff, and you don't think that this is serious after that. Fear, the spirit of fear. Go to Romans 8 and 2 Timothy 1. Romans 8, 2 Timothy 1. If I don't move along, then... And I just keep preaching. I'm never going to get through this lesson. So let's get, let's get a move on here. 2 Timothy 1 and Romans 8. Now you'll notice that God, he does not give us the spirit of fear. That is not of him. Well, if God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, who gives the spirit of fear? If you have a spirit of fear in you that is not of God, then who's the only being? That's Satan, right? That's why there's a spirit of fear you got to watch out, and that's from the devil. Romans 8, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's not of God. 2 Timothy 1, 7. 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, here's another thing. Once Satan gets you to fear him through his evil spirit, it makes you more prone to do more sins, more mistakes that are not right with God. Fear is such a dangerous thing. Fear leads you to addiction. Fear leads you to temper. Fear leads you to say things that you regret. Fear makes you hurt people unintentionally. That's what fear does. A lot of times, even with uh, therapists, which is very interesting when they deal with a lot of clients, fear is a number one issue that leads them to a lot of other mental problems. Fear is a very horrible issue. All right, three is slumber. Go to Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11. The devil, he can make you tired. He can make you slow and heavy. So you have to check each point here. Have I had sufficient sleep? Is the weather hotter that's making me groggier? Is my diet sufficient? Am I busier than I should be? If it's not those natural causes, then know this, that's the devil. That could be it. Romans chapter 11. Notice verse 8. There, there does exist a spirit of slumber. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of what? Slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. See, God can send an evil spirit of slumber. 
Let's look at Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6. Now, we do know that the Lord allows evil spirits, the devil, and devils, just like Job chapter 1, he allows them to attack the saint. And in this case, we see the spirit of slumber. Ephesians chapter 6, and then we'll look at uh, verse 12. The fourth one, which is very scary, is the thoughts. The thoughts. High places and things, high things in the Bible are referring to demonic spirits, okay? Look at Ephesians 6 and 2 Corinthians 10. I want you to compare the two, 2 Corinthians 10. They attack you with imaginations, such as daydreams, wrong thoughts, which are misunderstandings, perversions, worries, and endless stuff they add in your brain. brain stuff in your brain that you did not deliberately intend to, but the body just jumped the image. That's why it's best not to watch TV, video games, or any wicked thing to begin with. Because the brain wouldn't have conjured it up if it never experienced it, right? Because the brain just gives things unintentionally, especially when you dream and when you sleep. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against, look at this, spiritual wickedness in high places. So, the context of high will connect to demonic spirits, correct? It's a spiritual wickedness, that's demonic spirits. High places, that's the high context. The reason why that's important is 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. I need to prove to you that high things is referring to demonic spirit. If you don't think so, then Ephesians 6 is that proof text. 2 Corinthians 10 5 casting down imaginations and every high thing. So that's demonic spirits. But they are in line with imaginations. So you have to be careful of that. The next one is Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Death. Death can also be an attack from Satan where he tries to kill you because he's a murderer from the beginning. He might kill some loved one in your life. Why? To accomplish his goal, to accomplish his purpose. Job chapter 1. And the Lord can allow it to happen. He allowed Satan to do that. Because he wants to see how much you'll still trust in him, the Lord God Almighty. And also, it's very important to always arm yourself with prayer. Lord, protect us from the enemy. Why? Because not only he'll attack you spiritually, but literally to the point of your physical body where you do not exist anymore. That's how serious it is. Job chapter 1, verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him? And verse 11, But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee. To thy face. And then at verse 12, the Lord gives him permission. Notice verse 18 and 19, Job's children got killed. Job's children got killed. Okay, look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Now notice every single one of these verses, I try to prove to you there is a demonic spirit involved. So I'm not just giving you verses. Do you understand? We're not just groggily, drudgingly going through verses on death, wrong thoughts, and fear, error. No, no, no. All these verses show there is a demonic spirit involved in every one of these. So you want to know that this stuff is real. Luke chapter 4 and verse 9. Satan can tempt you to commit suicide like he did with Jesus. <laughs> can you believe that? You know who he tried to tempt with suicide? Can you believe this? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ain't that weird? Out of all sins and temptations, the devil wants to 
throw at the Lord God Almighty is suicide based on a scriptural reason. I think suicide is more prevalent than we think. It's more serious than we think, especially when you look at statistics of young people who commit suicide. That's how serious it is. Luke chapter 4, verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. And he quotes scripture at verse 10 and 11. But we know that Jesus gets the victory at verse 12. Let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 9 through 13 again. And here's the surprising one. A lot of you may not know, but listen, because I've seen Bible believers and especially Bible believing leaders mess up in this and hurt a lot of their members, hurt a lot of people who look up to them through this means. And it's one of the most evil means and it makes me very angry. And you never do this to them, which is why I'm very hard on preachers. You'll notice that online and in this church. I really kick hard on pastors out there. You know what the devil will use to attack you? Scripture. And it's that same passage. Do you see that there? Satan used Scripture to attack Jesus Christ. You always have a scriptural basis for the thing that you want to do. And then Bible believers, I know how they are. They'll say, well, you know, you don't want to twist Scripture. You just got to know the context. You got to know the verses. But, you know, I've seen Bible believers on both sides pull up their scriptural verses for their reasons, and it's hard to tell. So, don't get me wrong, scripture is final authority. There are people who twist scripture out there, but God will test your heart. And when he tests your heart, he can make you use the scripture to support your point of view toward how your heart feels. So you might be unintentionally twisting. Now, I'm sure all Bible believers can agree with me on this, especially those who twist it to their liking. Any Bible believer out there can use the scripture to support their stubborn point of view if they want to and make it look good. You don't think so, buddy? I can. I can. You know why I don't post a lot of videos against losers out there who try to point out scripture and make me look bad? They ain't worth it, bud. Because I can pull it and they'll retaliate and I'll pull it up and that supports the devil with making Bible believers look bad, and then the devil's crowd can say, see, look at that. So scripture shouldn't be final authority because both sides are twisting it however way they want. Have a nice day. The Lord rebuke you idiots out there instead who try to do that against me and post endless videos. Have a nice day. All right, Matthew chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. Matthew chapter 12. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Other one is tongues. The other one is tongues. Now, charismatics, they empty themselves inwardly so that some spirit can enter inside them and help them speak in tongues. But you have to understand that's not the Holy Spirit. When you empty yourself and then you go by something inside you to guide you which you think is all holy spirit led the holy spirit guiding you no that's de demon possession when you empty all of yourself for some spirit to guide you and lead you to speak inward emptiness is devil possession they don't realize that that's one proof against speaking in tongues second proof is when there's confusion in the room with everybody going blah, blah, blah like that. And confusion is not God being the author of it. Who's the author then of confusion, if not God? That's Satan. All right, so those are the two proofs you want to use against speaking in tongues to show that it is devil possession. It's not Holy Spirit led. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45 shows an inward emptiness leads more devils inside there. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. When he has come, he findeth it empty. 
swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than he. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? So verse 33, isn't that what charismatic church services are like? If they are, then Paul calls it confusion. Verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion. Now we're going to uh, look at 1 Corinthians 14, 33 again. And the next one is confusion. So if you are going through confusion in your life, in the decision that you make, and you're troubled in your heart, that's not God. That's the devil in you. So you need to cast that devil out, and you need to plead the blood of Christ and surrender yourself to God. So when you have hundreds of different Bibles that call themselves the Word of God, but they have different words, that's confusing, is it not? When you have so many churches that say, hey, let's get along, but they all have doctrines that differ from each other, that's confusing, is it not? And when there are idiots out there who claim themselves, who claim to follow the will of God, but they misguide the sheep and the sheep can't tell what's God's will or not, because so many people are saying things differently, that ain't of God, that's of the devil. And that includes Bible believers, amen. That's why it makes me very upset about that. You never misguide sheep. I hate it when you, people misguide sheep, especially when the sheep is sincere. I never like that. When you get so broken down in life and you become so confused on what to do, remember, the devil's doing that. And you need a moment of clarity, silence, prayer, and Bible reading. You need that. Don't just resume on in life, okay? With the confused fe feeling still lingering in your heart. Now, 2 Timothy 2 is the next one. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Wrong will. Wrong will. So Satan, he can attack you by making you follow the will of God wrongly or make you think that you're following the will of God when you are not. So be very careful when you seek after God's will. You want to make sure that you're making the right decision and what you're doing is of God. Say in 2 Timothy 2.26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. All right, let's go to John 13 and James 3. John 13 and James 3. Next one is feelings. Feelings. Oh, boy. That one is one of the number one issues next to thoughts. Next to thoughts, that's one of the number one issues. We live in such a feeling society, which is extremely dangerous. You know why this whole world wants to pump you up with so much estrogen, give you teachings that are filled with so much estrogen level? Socializing that's so much with estrogen. You know why they want to do that? Because that's all a demonic evil spirit. That's horrible. That's horrible. You don't want that in your life. John chapter 13 and verse 2, the Bible says, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the what? Heart of Judas Iscariot. Something got in his heart there. And the devil let it. James 3.14. Now this is a good verse. You might want to mark this one down. James 3.14 through 15. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts. Same thing like Judas in his heart, right? Now notice that's of the devil. Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, what? Sensual, devilish. Contemporary music is sensual. We live in a sensual atmosphere. TV shows have to make things sensual. Relationships now are becoming sensual, even in dating. And everybody's justifying that. That's demonic. Stay away from that. 
Your Christian life is a life of faith in God's word, not how you feel. Remember that. Okay, James chapter 3 again and verse 15 through 16. Now, I'm probably offending some people who are hearing me, but remember this. Now you have to ask yourself, is that of God you're feeling or the devil? That shows that we've been ca held captive by him for so long. We need to avoid that. This teaching, I might kind of get hard, and the reason why is not because I'm deliberately trying to step on toes. That's not the right thing to do. I'm not doing that. The reason why I'm doing that is because I'm showing how serious, serious this thing is that we've been held captive by these demonic spirits far too long. See, Christians can get devil-possessed. I strongly believe that. Some people don't believe it out there, but it makes me wonder how much they're aware of spiritual warfare. Possess means to hold, to have captive. If there's a spirit that held you captive for a while, that's possession, man. Now, we're going to look at James chapter 3, verse 15 through 16 again. Now, 15 shows sensual devilish, right? That's the context here. So we know it's not of God, but of the devil. But look at 16. That means criticism is of the devil. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Criticism. He's going to uh, attack you with criticisms from your loved ones, your family, and even Bible believers, people in church, the world out there. And uh, here's another one. Remember this, even legitimate criticisms, the devil will use that. So what do you do? Get hard on yourself? No. Plead the blood, plead for forgiveness, move on with your life. But if you let that thing bother you and you go back in your life and start to think about, oh man, uh, you know, it connected to everything that I did in the past and they were right about it and now you feel overtly guilty. Look, you're scum anyway, okay? You're guilty anyway. Plead the blood of Jesus, repent, believe in his promise of forgiveness and know that you're already scum, and that God, be thankful God can use scum buckets like you and move on with your life. Amen. Well, you're unloving. Well, you're cruel. Well, you're just this and that. You're just too rash, and guess what? Admit it. Yeah, I am, and probably a lot worse than that. Actually, I am a lot worse than that, but thank God he can still use me. I'm forgiven, and I just believe that it's a clean slate, and I just get over it, move on with my life, and try not to make the same mistake again. So what? Usually people who criticize you find problems with you. They don't really look at themselves. So don't let that get to you. <laughs> let, let me give you an eye-opener here. You don't think Satan can't find a legitimate criticism against you when he brings it up at the throne room of God? So why are you discouraged when people find legitimate criticisms against you? <laughs> There's plenty on your resume, okay? Just admit it and know that God can still use you and be thankful and move on. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. All right, here's a big one right here. Suffering. Suffering. Oh, boy. And guess what? Yes, God allows suffering to happen in your life and he tests you, but he uses the devil to buffet you. He uses the devil to beat, beat it out of you. Do you understand that? That's the devil beating you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Look at this. Notice what the word of God says here. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the what? Messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. But verse 9, God allowed it to happen. See that? Don't forget Job 1 through 2. God allows the devil to do what he wants against you. So when you suffer... Remember this, the devil's trying to get on to you, so don't let him win. Uh, discouragement is the next one. Go to Luke 22. Luke 22. Mm -hmm. 
Now, probably 80% in this list is the most common that happened to you and I, if not most or all of them. <laughs> but discouragement, I see, is a very contagious thing, even within our church, because we live in such a wicked area that we get hard on ourselves, or suffering makes us discouraged, or a lot of things. Problems happen in this church. He, Satan can tear you apart to the point of utter discouragement. That's what's called sifting right here. We're, viol, it's a violent separation of the grain from the stalk. Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, see that? Satan, Satan here, hath desire to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. The next one is health problems. Health problems. Health problems can come from natural causes, don't get me wrong, but it can also come from Satan. Now, uh, I mean, uh, it just happens all of a sudden, you got to realize. So you have to be aware of spiritual warfare. You got to be careful of that. Look at Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13. I mean, our revival meeting's coming, amen? But there has been a lot of demonic attacks that just been suddenly happening. Because it's been suddenly happening, there's been weird stuff happening, and we got to realize that there is a devil out there uh, who's attacking our health. And I noticed that with people in this church, like, Pastor, this never happened to me before, but it just suddenly happened. Well, with the upcoming blowout meeting, it's, it's a wonder, right? Luke chapter 13, verse 16. So we have to watch our health. We have to be very careful. We have to be very disciplined with how, what we eat and uh, what we're exposed to in our bodies. Luke 13, 16. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Look at Job 2, Job 2. So notice that this woman who was suffering this ailment and Jesus healed him, <coughs> he said that Satan had bound her. <coughs> Best advice is this, like from the example that I gave in checking up your health, see if it really came from natural causes or not. And then you'll be more wary that the devil, he's using those factors to get to you. That'll help you a lot to be more aware of spiritual warfare. Look at Job 2 and verse 7. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. See, the devil gave Job sickness. Satan himself. Preacher problems. Go to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. That's why your preacher needs prayer. Amen. You might say, why does he need prayer? I need prayer too. The church needs prayer. I get that. They're, they're important. But you have to realize that because the preacher leads the church, they're especially attacked. Because once he gets out of church, I mean, see how effective the church works after that. If you get a member who gets attacked by the devil, the church effective, effectiveness compared to losing a pastor is very, very different, and you know that. Now, this is not to belittle members. You are important, too, because I don't care who you are, when one of you get out of church, it really affects the atmosphere. You know that. Now think about the pastor being gone. Have fun taking care of the blowout. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. That's why... The, Preachers need prayer. But also, the devil can really get to them. Preachers are not immune. Verse 1, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. All right, but look at verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the what? Now, that's the problem with preachers is pride. Let me repeat that again. A problem with preachers, including Bible believers out there, is pride. And you need to constantly look at that. Now, you look at verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the what? Snare, Snare of the devil. He must be a good testimony. You know who, don't, who can 
give a lick about their testimony and uh, who get prideful easily. Those who call themselves preachers but don't even run a church and they're online. Aha! They're caught by the devil. When they pull up this persecution complex too, that's even worse. You know who are the suckers there? Those who watch those kind of losers online. Sorry, but you're a loser if you admire those type of preachers and watch those type of preachers. You're a loser when those guys can't, aren't even fit to even run a church. That's why they get suckers because the best place to get suckers is always online. You ever seen these scam artists? You know what the best place to do it is? Online. Because there's plenty of suckers out there. I hope that people watching online heard me say that. That's how important it is. You guys are so deceived out there. It's not even funny. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Please stay away from that bunch. Local church is very important. And when people attack the local church meeting in a local church and stuff like that, that is demonic. That is extremely dangerous because that's a demonic spirit in them. And those people, you'll notice it, they could care less what people think about them. And they have a horrible testimony already. And the ones who are best evidences of that are people who used to join their channel and then when they saw their dark side and they left that, and they get hurt by those same online preachers. They're the only ones who get that, except the suckers online who are still entrapped by those online so-called preachers. I hope that's an eye-opener. I hope they're watching and hearing this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. Lack of forgiveness. Lack of forgiveness. Ooh, all right. Let's park it here for a while. Satan can attack the church with lack of forgiveness. You might say, why is that? Because when people hold grudges and people hold feelings of hurt and forgiveness is not on the table, oh, the devils can use that one day. Oh, you can hold it pretty good and act all loving, but only one stress factor has to come in and then it just blows up everything you had in your heart and mind against that person. Yeah, amen, 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 amen. Don't hold grudge. Don't keep that feeling of hurt. You need forgiveness. You need to experience forgiveness. You need the, maybe it's not just you forgiving that person. You need to experience the forgiveness of Christ himself in your heart. That's what you desperately need and you need to pray for. What can help you experience that more is to ponder on rather than you're wrong and you forgiving the person, but experiencing the forgiveness of Christ more. Think about those nail-pierced hands. Think about how many times God was patient and putting up with you, and not just you, but the person who wronged you too. As much as that person hurt you and wronged you, that person did the same thing to Jesus Christ when he nailed him on the cross and tortured him. That person didn't do that to you. Did that make any sense? All right. Verse 10 through 11. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I, to, I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, now we're going to go through a little bit uh, quickly here, so you all follow along with me. Lack of pleasure. Now that's surprising, lack of pleasure is also a demonic attack. That's why I don't believe in annihilating pleasure like Buddhist monks or Catholic monks. Oh, they're doing that to be closer to Jesus Christ. No, that's a demonic spirit there. You know why? Because then there's a bunch of pedophilia, pedophiles coming out after that. Come on, Yeah. You know why? You can't annihilate your flesh. How did such a... Okay, stop talking, Gene. Move on, all right? All right. Psalm 6... Write down these two verses. Psalm 16, verse 11, and 2 Timothy 3, 4. Psalm 16, 11, and 2 Timothy 3, 4. Notice that these verses show there's nothing wrong with pleasure. God supports pleasure. The only, re, the only place where pleasure is wrong is where it exceeds God. So that's what those two verses show. Now, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, write that down, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. When you feel so deprived of pleasure, 
what's going to happen is the devil will attack you with sinful pleasures, including sexual ones. So it is very important that you do... Now, this might be funny to some of you, but yes, you need a break. That's why Pastor Hilton Smith mentioned you pastors need a hobby out there. It may not sound spiritual, but go surfing if that's what gives you joy and pleasure. So you have to do something pleasurable, otherwise you're going to stress out and do something sinful. As a matter of fact, in this same chapter, Paul mentioned that it was better to marry than to burn. What did that mean? It's better to do sex right than sex wrong. Now, sex might sound like, a, oh man, it's such a taboo word, but no, that's a gift from God. Pleasure is a gift from God. The only time where it's wrong is because we live in such a perverted, stinking, wicked world that abuses pleasure everywhere. And they turn it so dark that now we think that we become spiritual by avoiding it altogether, when actually that's another demonic spirit that you're trading spirits for. All right. Move on, move on, move on. Okay, interferences. Interferences. 1 Thessalonians 2.18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and then verse 18. Whenever you do something spiritual, Satan attacks you with hindrances. That's why you got to be watchful and keep praying because the devil can interfere you with car accidents, traffic jams, phone calls, noise around you, crying babies, etc., etc. So you have to realize the devil can use these things. So you have to always be wary of that. 20 is idleness. Idleness and big mouths. Idleness and big mouths. Why would you put them together? Why can't you separate them? Because they usually go together. You know? When you've got nothing to do all day long, phone calls, talking to people, gossip, seeing something bad and telling something bad about someone else, blah, blah, blah. Look, you got to learn to shut your mouth. You got to learn to shut your mouth. 1 Timothy 5, uh, 3 through 14. 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 14. Uh, the other one, let's see right here. So keep yourself occupied. Best advice is when you're always so busy with something, the, the less you talk, and then the less bad stuff comes out. Well, you might say that uh, you don't have a big mouth, but you have plenty of idleness. And what's going to happen is, you know what the, where the big mouth is? Is your head, your heart. And you wonder why you have so many negative feelings and thoughts? That's what idleness does. All right, move on, move on, move on. Saints, saints. So the devil can attack you with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, have you heard many times. That's 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1 and verse 14. Verse 1 and verse 14. Saints. Now you'll notice right here that the devil can attack you through another saint who is highly regarded. In this case, you know who it was? King David, a man after God's own heart. The Bible says Satan moved him. And told Joab to number the children of Israel. That's serious. So a church member could be at fault. A treasurer can have embezzlement issues. A close friend can betray you. A pastor can sin or do some mistake that can hurt a saint. And that, those are all demonic attacks. Temptations is the general one. And that's Genesis 3. Uh, did I say 21 verse 1 and verse 14? Add verse 14, and the other one is Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, that's for temptations, temptations. And by the way, the more specific ones, and you wrote this in the last Bible study, but it bears repeating. He attacks through three main means, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and then the pride of life. Be careful what you see. Be careful of the pride in your heart. And be careful of how you feel, okay? Then I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Preparations for demonic attacks. Preparation for demonic attacks. All right, that's a lot of evil spirits, right? A lot of evil spirits, a lot of, to work on. But believe it or not, 
God made your weapon simple to solve all 22, 30, 100 problems, 100 devils that you got. He has a couple solutions, and you don't have to uh, freak out about it. So you might say, what are they? Well, just start using them, and you might be surprised. One is the belt of truth, okay? One is the belt of truth. So here's your armory. Preparations for demonic attacks are as follows. The belt of truth, Ephesians 6, 14a. The strength of a man is in his loins. Greater strength lies on a frank, honest person who is filled with dependability. A lot of times, you don't want to be honest with yourself. You want to run away from your defects, your problem, right? You're not being honest with yourself. You've got to be honest and admit and confess Okay, I am running away from this problem. I don't want to talk about this problem, but I must talk about it. And you've got to be honest to God and pour it all out in prayer. A, a person who keeps lying and who's a con artist is never honest with himself or herself and even fools himself or herself. See that? You may not be a liar, but trust me, when you lie to yourself, that's just building up to that. And pretty soon you're going to lie about every other sin problem and other stuff you're hiding if you're not careful. That's why you're not dependable in the church. You're not dependable with your family because you're not an honest person they can trust fully. That's already a convicting sermon right there. But see, that's where greater strength lies. Greater strength lies within the man's loins, so that loins must be girded with honesty. When you're honest, you become a stronger person. Even counseling sessions talk about that. A client who's the most honest with himself or herself will be able to hit the root causes, and that's where the strength lies, and they can work out a lot of other complicated issues. All right, you must have the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness right here. Ephesians 6.14. A Christian already has God's righteousness, but he's supposed to wear it in battle. So how often do you wear God's holiness? Because any sin can enter inside your heart, so you've got to protect it. Oh, you got too many rules, too many restrictions. That's called a breastplate of righteousness, preventing sin from getting inside our hearts. Call it what you want, legalism, I don't care. All right, the next one is verse 15, gospel shoes. Gospel shoes. Wherever your feet go, you must be ready to give the gospel. Why? Because everywhere your feet goes, it wants to do what it wants to do. It wants to go to sin. But when you're preoccupied with people, uh, when you're always thinking about whatever you say, do, and ever you go is to give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it keeps you away from trouble a lot keeps you thinking about the main thing and keeping the main thing the main thing. That filters out a lot of confusion, too, when you think about that. All right, the, sixth, uh, the next one, the fourth one is the shield of faith. Uh, the shield of faith. Ephesians 6.16, 6, Ephesians 6.16. 6, if you do not have strong faith, then you will be torn apart by any attack the devil throws at you. The martyrs and missionaries, why did they become known as men of great faith? Because they had strong faith. So they were able to withstand the flame, the torture. So no matter what torturous thing you're going through in your life right now, you got to believe in God's promise and his word. If you don't believe in that, then the devil will get to you. So that's why you don't have a good defense, because you have weak faith. Uh, that's Ephesians 6.16. 6, the next one is helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. Uh, if you lose your arm and leg in battle, you can still survive, but not your head. So, your head, so you need to be saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. If you don't have that, then... <laughs> every, then all the devil has to do is hit that head and then you all fall apart. 
The sixth one is the sword of the Spirit. Sword of the Spirit. That's your only offensive weapon. That's why so many churches have fallen, no matter how, how good they are, more sincere they are, more spiritual they are than you, because they don't have the right book, the right Bible. They don't have right doctrine. They, and if you Bible believers have the right book, right doctrine, you haven't been reading. You haven't been studying. You haven't been memorizing. And that's why this, the devil never left you alone. You just kept encouraging to keep to keep attacking you. When you read that book, memorize, quote scripture, get the right Bible and all that, you're discouraging the devil to attack you. Because why? You're poking him with the blade. But see, he's never hurt by a blade, so he just keeps throwing things at you. Why won't the devil leave me alone, pastor? Read your Bible. <laughs> memorize verses finally. What have you been doing all this time? All right, the next one is Ephesians 6.14. Ephesians 6.14. You know, it's very interesting that the Bible never mentions armor on the back. You notice that? It's all in the front. You know why? God expects you not to expose your back to the enemy. What does that mean? You have no choice but to move on. When you run away, you've exposed yourself to the enemy to attack you. You think running away is a solution? No, it'll kill you. It'll encourage the devil to find a weak spot and to attack you. Uh, verse 18, you'll notice that the Bible doesn't mention armor on your knees as well. Why? Because prayer is in the context there. So God expects you to fall on your knees to pray. And then lastly, the ninth one, so this should be number nine, you must be wholly armed. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Fully armed. That's verse 11 and verse 13. Verse 11, verse 13. Notice it says to take on the whole armor of God. You cannot, you cannot attack the devil when you only have defense. You cannot defend yourself from the enemy if you only have an offense, offensive weapon. One cannot stand without the other. You know who are the people that the devil has the hardest time to attack? I'll tell you who, who they are. They are saved, sincerely honest, soul winning, sanctified holy, Bible believers who are strong in the faith and pray on their knees. That's all of that. So be holy armed. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to our hearers and help us to be uh, armed fully with your armor. And I pray that uh, whatever attack the devil will throw at us, that we won't get discouraged, that we won't run away, that we'll have strong faith in you. And then apply the armor, no matter how long the battle is. As that, old preach, uh, as that one preacher saying, I'm going to die on the battlefield. So let us think and act that way in our spiritual warfare. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.